So how do brains work? Well, we've already established that we don't know. But what are the pieces that we can use to put together here to begin to approach this remarkable object? Well, at the heart of the neuroscience of the last 120 years, 115 years maybe, is something called a neuron doctrine. Doctrine. It's a belief. The question being asked and the answer being offered by the neuron doctrine revolve around that word function. In order to understand what something does, you need to understand how its parts fit together in some sense, how they work together and towards what ends they work together. That is what function do they serve? Now, with the brain, we're not, we're not in quite in the same position as we are with the heart. With the heart, we can recognize the body as the domain of concern, and then we can ascribe a function to the heart. We're not sure where to start with the brain. So let's start with the neurons. Now, the brain is part of the nervous system. The brain and the top part of the spinal cord constitute the central nervous system, which is connected to the peripheral nervous system. It's all one large organ of the body, if you will. And there are many kinds of cells in there. And most of the attention has so far been paid to one kind of cell, which is the neuron. This is a picture of a neuron, a grossly simplified one. Um, neurons come in many kinds. Uh, they vary quite a lot, but the basic architectural principles of a neuron are shown here. There's a cell body with a nucleus. These are nucleated cells. There are a bunch of extensions from this. There are short, bushy extensions feeding in, as it were. Those are the dendrites. And then there's typically a single long projection called the axon, which extends quite a long way and then itself ends in a bushy arborescence. Um, the dendrites are typically thought of as inputs and the axon is typically thought of as, gener as the product of the neuron. The neuron generates a signal that propagates down the axon, but all those words need to be qualified just a little bit. If we measure what's going on in an axon, what we see is a time series like this. Occasionally, large electrical spikes pass from the nucleus all the way down, causing the release of chemicals at the far end of the axon. These spikes are known as action potentials. They are discrete. They either happen or they don't happen. We don't find half spikes. And the role of the neuron is not immediately clear. This is one cell type among many cell types. It has some fascinating properties. And we need to look into the history of how the neuron has been regarded. So if we go back to 1906, the first time the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine was shared, it was shared between these two characters, Ramoni Cajal and Camilio Golgi. Now, 1906 is a long time ago. In 1906, by this time, it was clear that the body is made out of tissues and tissues are made out of cells. But it was only around this time that the cells of the nervous system were identified for the first time. Some cells are easier to spot than others. Big cells are obviously easier to spot than small cells. The peculiarity of the organization of the nervous system is that spells, cells are very hard to follow individually. When you get a whole bunch of axons collected together in a nerve, identifying individual components is very hard because they are very, very thin. And if you come upon an axon, the cell nucleus may be quite some way away. So it was only around this time that techniques were developed to resolve the individual cells in the nervous system, the neurons specifically, and it was Camilo Golgi who developed a technique for identifying them. It was a method of staining, so you would take a slice of nervous system tissue and you would use various chemicals to wash most of the stuff away and use a particular stain 
um, in order to make visible the projections of the individual neuron. Golgi's staining technique was extremely useful and revealed all kinds of details about the connectivity between these things, the structure of the individual neuron. It left no doubt that the nervous system tissue was tissue made of cells like everything else. And Golgi used this to form a view of, as it were, how we should understand the nervous system functionally. Ramon y Cajal used Golgi's staining system. He was very, very good at it. He was better than Golgi at it. Back then, the best way to document what you saw through the microscope was not using photographs, but by drawing. And in fact, in drawing, you can bring out highlight details that might be difficult to see in a photograph. And Ramon y Cajal was brilliant at drawing these. So between them, they were resolving the properties of the individual neurons on the basis of images like these, which were prepared by drawing. So Golgi's staining technique was a silver nitrate preparation that was used, showed this arborescence, this forest of neurons for the first time. Now, the thing about the funny thing about this joint award of the prize is that these two guys couldn't agree on anything. They couldn't agree on where to go for lunch together. They differed enormously in what they thought the basic unit that we should pay attention to in the nervous system is. Part of the reason that they disagreed is because they saw different things. Ramon y Cajal was simply better than Golgi at drawing, and he resolved details that Golgi missed. In particular, Ramon y Cajal was paid great attention to the tiny, tiny, tiny processes around the connections between neurons. And he resolved this, that he was able to see that there were gaps separating one neuron from the following neuron. Whereas Golgi, Golgi's drawings from the time didn't quite resolve to the same level of detail. So Golgi, by not seeing these very small gaps between the neurons, formed the view that there was not a great deal to be had from studying individual neurons, but that they formed, collectively they formed networks, which were the important functional unit of the brain. So he didn't see individual neurons as being particularly distinguished, no more than an individual liver cell is particularly distinguished. And he thought that as we approach this big topic of the brain and we want to understand what it does, that is, what functions and how, we, how to understand this word function, he thought distributed networks of these nerve cells was the right level of analysis. And he thought that decomposing this into individual neurons would lose everything. Ramon y Cajal proposed a different view Based on his more careful drawings, he recognized that one could identify the activity of a single neuron and separate it from the activity of other neurons around it. So each neuron was, in a certain sense, autonomous, and each neuron seemed to receive inputs at the dendrites, and those inputs, when we say inputs, what I mean is that they're, the activity of neurons before this, before a given neuron would cause electrical signals to propagate, which would release chemicals, as we now know, into the gap between the neurons. And these chemicals would sum up in the neuron until that sum reaches a critical threshold, at which point a spike is generated. Now, we have a much clearer picture of this than, the, than Ramon y Cajal had at the time. But he could see something like this coming into shape. The all-or-nothing nature of that spike greatly impressed him, and he was paid a great deal of attention to these gaps between neurons, which are called synapses. And we know tons of details about this now, particularly about the complexities of these connections between neurons and the role of chemicals called neurotransmitters that act as mediators from one neuron to the next. Now... The 1906 prize-giving ceremony must have been something to see. Golgi spoke first, 
and everything Golgi said was the exact opposite of what Cajal spoke, and they weren't shy about their opposition either. Ramona Cajal later accused him of having a strange mental constitution that was hermetically sealed against criticism by its egocentricity. This is them's fighting words. So in 1906, this was certainly not settled business, but over time, Ramona Cajal's view won out and the neuron doctrine informed neuroscience for most of the 20th century, I, I suppose. But as I said, we've learned an awful lot in that time, and we wouldn't pose the question in the same way today as it, was, as it appeared to them in 1906. Today, we would fill in an awful lot more detail, and the detail complicates the picture. The neuron doctrine, according to which, let's go back and have a look, the way to understand this is through the summation of inputs from the dendrites, leading to the passing of a threshold and the generation of a spike that flows in orderly fashion from the nucleus down to the bushy branches, where it then causes a chemical activity, which is sensed by the following cell. That is the basic of the neuron doctrine, and we know a lot more about it now. We've studied this a lot. We have found exceptions, lots of exceptions to this. We have found, for example, different kinds of connections between neurons, including direct electrical electrical, though by and large, the connections in the brain must be thought of as electrochemical, not electrical, most of them. We have, in some cases, found spikes going the wrong way, going up the axon. Um, remember I said that in order to resolve these neurons, you used chemical preparations to wash everything else away and then stained them to, so you could see their detail. Well, it turns out that a lot of the stuff that got washed out there is important too. There are as, at least as many glial cells in the nervous system as there are neurons. Glial cells were previously thought to provide insulation because we've got a lot of electrical activity. If you have axon lying on axon, then there would be a lot of cross pollution between the signals. But it turns out the glial cells are doing an awful lot more than that. And we don't fully understand the relationship between glial cells and neurons. So we've got more questions as usual. We've even found dendrites producing spikes. And our view of the synapse as a simple place of a conduit of transmission from one neuron to the next, that has become vastly more complex. We recently spotted tripartite synapses where we've got one neuron, another neuron, and a bunch of glial cells enclosing them, and together they form what might be a functional unit. That is, it's a complex dynamical system that has, seems to have its own properties, and more. The required reading provides some overview of this. What is important is that the simple view um, of Ramon y Cajal needs to be augmented with an awful lot more detail. There's a lot more going on than was evident in 1906. That's no big surprise. Ramon y Cajal was more or less right. But interestingly, the way that we currently view activity in the brain has affinities with both the divisions of both of these men. That is where Golgi saw networks of connected new neurons as being the most important thing to pay attention to. And Cajal said, no, it's the individual neuron. There's a sense in which they're both right because we see temporary coalitions of neurons, populations of neurons, groups of neurons transiently assembled and working together and then disassociating. So it's almost like both of these guys were right. Well, they were very brilliant characters. So that was 1906. If we fast forward now to 2014, we'll find two huge brain projects, one in Europe and one in the United States. Here's the European one, the Human Brain Project. Um, and these set out in order to... Find out about this damn thing, this brain thing that carries so much weight in our culture. And the scientists are no more unified today than they were back in 1906. This is a billion euro project and six, more than 600 European scientists signed an open letter stating that it was misconceived, was going to miss it goals, was being mismanaged. The world of neuroscience is still heavily contested. 
But that's a little bit of history to start us off.